Hi, everyone, and welcome to our pre-concert talk for our final concert of this year. It's been kind of a trying year, but it's really exciting that we will reopen in September. As always, I am joined by my dear friend, Lori Shulman, our musical guide, and she's actually not at home, and she'll tell you where she is right now. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Gary, and good afternoon, everyone. I am coming to you over Zoom from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, where I have been hiking in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And I have to tell you that the site of this magnificent park in the full bloom of spring is the perfect backdrop for drumming up enthusiasm for this all 19th century ultra romantic program that we have today. It's a great program, and it's a program I'm very, very excited about. It's beautiful music. You could say it's kind of a quartet concert, because uh, even though our anchor work is a string quintet, there's two quartets on this. Let, let's start with Schubert and, uh, and talk about quartet sauce. This is a unique movement within Schubert's output because it exists independently. It's not joined by a slow movement, a scherzo and a finale, but it is extremely important and popular in the string quartet literature because it's such a bellwether work. It signals a huge change in his style that is as different as the great C major or the unfinished symphony from one of the early symphonies, which are so clearly modeled on Mozart and especially Haydn. Um, there are so many technical issues with this piece. And I just want to draw the audience's attention to it because the genius of Schubert is he was able to write music that just seemed to kind of roll off his tongue. But when you rehearse this piece, I don't know a single quartet, when they're telling the truth, that doesn't think this is incredibly complicated work for intonation, for the kind of stroke you use, that very opening. It's called, what's called a double stroke. So each note gets two notes and it, it gives an excitement, sort of a shimmering quality to it. I always think about how much do I love this music and how much work it takes to actually pull it off. Agreed. And I can only uh, sympathize as a keyboard player and not a string player, but we must remember that Schubert and everyone in his family were string players. And so he knew exactly how difficult this music was. Let's take a listen to this extraordinary opening. You could probably hear the double stroke that Gary was talking about, but when you see the performance, the live performance that you'll be listening to later, you'll be able to see it as well. And it heightens this feeling of turbulence, of nervous agitation that characterizes this opening. It's not what you would call singable music. Schubert is inevitably compared to Beethoven with some of his dramatic music. But for me, this couldn't be more different from Beethoven for the simple reason that it always reverts to the fact the man was a, was a song composer. He was, he was maybe like the popular composer of our time. And the music, the nervousness you're referring to, in some ways is just the foundation for the gorgeous melodies that he writes. It's not really a dark work, although it's, you could say it's a sad work. Um, but certainly has incredible energy, which always sort of manifests itself in gorgeous melodies. You are quite right in pointing out his uh, prominence as a song composer. The songs were the first music he was actually able to get published, and they were arguably the greatest commercial successes that he had in his lifetime, his tragically short lifetime. But um, the song writing ability comes through so clearly in his melodious second theme. Let's listen to that and the dramatic contrast it forms with the opening turbulence that we just heard. have an ultimately singable melody that just is begging for the human voice and it wants the sweetness of the string sound to highlight it. Can you imagine what it must have been like for them to have a string quartet surrounded by all the ladies and all the gentlemen? Not much room there, right? And, you know, to have that first violin soaring theme way up high in position with a short fingerboard, that must have been thrilling for the audience as well as for the players because they could see the action right close like a a salon, which this is. 
Agreed. And of course, in these Schubertiade gatherings, there would have been both men and women who would sing Schubert's songs as often as not, he would be at the piano and there would be a mixture of string music and songs for the entertainment after dinner. A little bit later on in this movement, you might have heard in with, behind underlying that gorgeous melodic second theme that the accompanying strings were still a little bit nervous in their accompaniment and the balance of the movement seesaws back and forth between this agitation and this melodious calm. I hear it as a harbinger of full-blooded romanticism. Let's listen to the next example. Gary, tell us how the string players shift from this gorgeous lyricism to this stormy, crazy stuff that's going on. You've got a, the first violin it has some very awkward passage work there. The, the scales, again, we talked in many of these pre concert talks how Western music was all built on scales and arpeggios. But Schubert throws in what we would call wrong notes in there. And he shifts the harmony in the middle of a scale, which is very complicated for the entire group. He arranges a harmony in the accompanying instruments to be pretty much stable. And then the melodic scale playing is different. So it becomes a real problem. And also I wanna draw the audience's attention to those triplets underneath all of this yada, papada, papada stuff, because that's actually what keeps the thing going. And it's the kind of rhythm, you would get that in La Mer of, of, of Debussy, for example. Um, so between that stuff and the double stroke and the tremolo, you have constant energy of different sorts of energy, but that energy is always present nonetheless. Which is very much a sign of what would develop into romantic music. Exactly. If we fast forward to a few decades later, actually toward the tail end of the 19th century, we get to another movement that stands on its own, but in this case, the Tchaikovsky Andante Cantabile is drawn from his first string quartet. And this has become such a, an audience favorite and a string favorite that it's taken on a life of its own and has been arranged for any number of different instrumental combinations. We, of course, are hearing it as the string quartet movement that it was originally conceived of. Where does the string quartet fit into the quartet literature, Gary? It, Tchaikovsky, we have to kind of go back to Tchaikovsky, the man. Tchaikovsky was very insecure. Um, and I would say he was incredibly insecure about his chamber music. If you really think about it, so you have the three string quartets, but you also have the gigantic piano trio and a, and a failed uh, fragment of an earlier trio. So in some ways, if you look at his outputs of the operas, the ballets, the symphonic literature, the chamber music literature is, is quite meager. Basic problem was he did not think that much of his chamber music was sensational. And he kept working on it, but unlike Brahms, who kept working on it, say with a B major trio, it did not really result in anything that he was fully um, engaged with. Actually, I, I have to say, I do love all the three uh, string quartets. And I think this is one of the most gorgeous slow movements ever written, the way he really understood the string instruments. He learned as a pianist how to treat the string instruments, just like he learned how to treat the woodwinds. You can see a real evolution with the knowledge of how to make the violin sing, how to make the cellos work. And here in this Andante Cantabile, even though it's a relatively early work, you can see he's got skills already that he did not have in his earliest works when it comes to the strings. And this is just a gorgeous movement. Well, at this point, I think we should listen to the opening of it. I would, I would have to say the sublime opening of this Andante Cantabile, just to refresh the audience's memory. For my 
my ears, what makes this so magical is that as smooth and serene as it sounds, he's actually alternating measures of 2-4 and 3-4, which is a very common meter in Russian folk music. And it lends a particular Russian quality to this extraordinary theme. Well, this theme, in fact, is a Russian folk song. And one of the things that I love about it is you can actually see a direct connection from this 5-4 that you just referred to to the music of Stravinsky, especially for the Firebird, because you can see that evolution from this music, from Rimsky-Korsakov, all the way to Stravinsky by Lakhiri for all the, the great Russians of the 20th century. And he infuses later on in the middle section, we hear another theme that is quintessential Russian melancholy. The cello is playing pizzicato and the inner voices are sighing. so reminded of the Juliet theme in Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet. Again, he was the master of wearing one's heart on one's sleeve, and this flourished most brilliantly in his orchestral music, but he was definitely at the top of his game when he came up with this movement. This, this middle section in F minor is actually very interesting. On paper, I would say it could be construed as a, a tragic middle section. But I don't hear it that way at all. In fact, I don't play it that way. I really think it's just a, a matter of, like Souvenir de Lunacher, you know, it's something that's just a kind of a souvenir of a place that you love. You, you, you miss it. <laughs> I really think it's just something uh, about a place you love. And hey, I can't wait to get back there. But right now I can't be there. Yes. And of course, at the end, he brings back that sublime opening theme to leave us at peace and with the full sense that all is calm, all is well, and we will sleep well tonight. We should move on now to our anchor work, this magnificent string quintet in B flat major of Felix Mendelssohn, one of the great chamber music geniuses of the Romantic era. I think that the beginning of the first movement will speak for itself. Let's hear it before we discuss it, Gary. <laughs> first started preparing this talk a couple of weeks ago, both of us zeroed in immediately on the startling resemblance to the opening of the octet that Mendelssohn wrote when he was 16 years old. As you can see from this slide, Mendelssohn had a tragically short lifetime, actually rather like Schubert, which was not at all <laughs> uh, in my planning for this, but they both had very short lifetimes. And yet Mendelssohn was just a shooting star of a talent. At 16, he was able to write the octets shortly thereafter, the, the Midsummer Night's Dream. By really age 18, he wrote the kind of music that we play over and over already, and it, he was fully formed. He just exploded onto the scene. And here, you can hear, the, in some ways, the difference between the excitement that we heard in the Schubert and here. This is a tremolo, which is just the same note over and over as you change harmonies. Here, he adds to that energy in the strings as the first violin, states that first melody. It's really the first violin against the quartet with the two violas. It's, it's, it's an incredible way of orchestrating, if you will, chamber music. I don't know actually at this point if anyone else had ever done it, including Schubert. I don't think they did. Schubert, I think, has a more menacing quality in the opening to the quartet sots, whereas the string quintet it feels like a very positive, exuberant sort of energy, especially when you hear that soaring theme that comes from the get-go. We have to wait a little while for the soaring theme in the Schubert. With the Mendelssohn, it's right there from square one. And because he was classically trained, he was steeped in Bach, as well as Mozart and Haydn, his second theme is going to be by the books, a more what Schumann would have called a more feminine theme after this very masculine, muscular opening.
it's a classic contrast in character between the first theme and the second theme. And it serves, those two themes serve as the building blocks for the entire movement with the addition of one important transitional device, which is the use of triplets. And he moves them around, changes his mind about which of the five voices are going to participate in the triplets, but they sort of function as the glue that puts the whole thing together. Let's listen to a clip from the development section. These triplets are introduced in the exposition, but what we're going to hear is snippets of both the first theme, the second theme, and the triplets. So you could probably hear he's using these things, these triplets as a building block and as a transitional device, but he's got the motivic rhythms from those first two themes as a constant and everything is woven together in a way that is almost but not quite like counterpoint. It's very complex texture, isn't it, Gary? It is, and I'm so glad you mentioned it because I wanted to draw the audience's attention to the two violas. Going back to the Baroque, the viola was really not a developed instrument. And even though Bach, both J.C. Bach and Johann Sebastian Bach wrote things for the viola, but it was never a starring instrument. In this quintet, which as we mentioned before, it's a very unusual string quintet, the two violas play an incredible anchor role in, in the piece. And this example we just heard both violas are the engine that stirs this. I always listen to those inner voices more than I actually listen to the melody because the melody being beautiful and everything else is, is, is in some ways less exciting than what's going on under the hood. Well, moving on to the Andante Scherzando, I am fascinated by this movement because Mendelssohn is so celebrated as a tremendous writer of energetic and fleet elfin scherzos. This one's very different. It's at a moderate pace, but it's got this scherzando quality to it. It has this little edge of humor in it, and it's very modest in scale too. I mean, we have this gigantic first movement, and then it's followed by this little andante scherzando that's barely four, four and a half minutes. The music is delicate and understated, and we keep expecting something to explode with humor or energy, but it's very well-mannered the whole time. Let's listen. minuet and it's certainly not a waltz but that triple time to me seems closely related to German folk dance. What do you absolutely. think Gary? Absolutely I, I think it's really a modified Londler and it has incredible humor in it but what I really love about it is it's not slap on your knee humor. I think it's much more of a coy sort of winking humor uh, to me, this is exactly where all of the early Mahler symphonies get their uh, umph, if you will. It, it, it's, it sits there on the border of the minuet and maybe some of the more refined dances and the Landler dances, the country dances of Germany and Austria. Um, it's a genius movement because in some ways, all of the instruments I would say are quite uncomfortable because you really can't relax in anticipation of what you're trying to do. It's, this one is the one that you rehearse most. This is the one that, need, it's, it's a little bit like the whole world is in a snow globe. The middle section moves from G minor to G major. And here is another example of the importance of the violas in this texture because he gives the melody to the viola. Let's hear it. We 
heard the viola toward the end of that example, but that transition is absolutely seamless. And the way he effects the modulation from G minor to G major really sets up the stage so that when the viola takes that melody, it's had this wonderful curtain raising on it and it does sort of function as a spotlight. Mendelssohn was just such a genius at elisions. And if you listen to the accompaniment in the first violin before the viola solo, the, the engine is always running. The way to do it, the way we always do it, is you let the viola in and generally the tempo becomes much more flexible. The skill it takes to compose something like that when you know as a player you're going to need that flexibility built in is quite remarkable. Yes, and he also understood the importance of shifts in character when he moved both within one movement and from one movement to the next. We hear a completely different side of Mendelssohn's character in the third movement, which is marked adagio and lento. It's a tragic movement in D minor with very dense string writing. Let's listen. you describe the string texture here, Gary? I'm hearing a little bit of chorale at the opening, but that changes. I think actually this entire quintet is rife with allusions to chorales, to psalms, um, to many Protestant gestures. And it is a tragic movement, as you said. It's more written in blocks. And in rehearsing it, it's actually quite I don't want to say easy, but certainly much easier to interpret because the the texture of it is very well written. There's pretty much one principal voice and how you build the voices below it. Basically, everything is in the music and the great works. Why do you know we have what they call war horses? Because they're really well written. And and this one, it's 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 an incredible miracle, I think, when we play this, because yes, every performance is different but the texture of this has to remain the way he wrote it. The architecture is in the music. And yet it's not monochromatic because he introduces sighing figures and pulsating figures. It's just that they're at a more gentle pace because of the overall mood of the Adagio e Lento. Absolutely. Well, also the way he treats the two violins is very different in this movement than the others. There's a lot of divergent motion, um, a lot of things that have to take place between the two violins and he lets the other instruments actually thin out. Um, in, in some ways, it's a corollary to the Andante Cantabile. I mean, they're both uh, gorgeous movements. I think this one's much more serious um, and, yeah. and, and, and much more difficult to pull off because of the slow tempo. You know, well, does it flow that, that well and it's not meant to. But he does give us a little bit of respite from this tragedy. Let's listen to an example from a little farther into the slow movement. It's sort of a silver lining after all of these clouds. is a suspenseful tremolo, a sort of cousin to what happened at the very beginning of the first movement before moving without pause to the finale. Let's hear a little bit of that transition.
tightening the tension two ways. One of them is this nonstop tremolo that's going on in the lower strings. And the other is the extremely high range that the melody is carrying in, in the first violin. This is really a chorale, but it's also transformation from that A major second theme group, which is so blissful. And he actually make, makes it into kind of like one melody where you have elements of both as the violin climbs up on the instrument and everybody else supports it you get both the character of the bliss and the tragic character of the opening. Yes, and he's, he's ready to move to bliss and fancy bliss, flashy bliss. It's practically a foreshadowing of Sarasate, uh, but a few decades earlier, let's listen to this brilliant opening of the finale. <laughs> Mendelssohn is absolutely determined that you are going to be in a good mood at the end of this quintet. And as you can see from the images that we're showing you, he was also a gifted watercolorist. And luckily for us, quite a few of his beautiful watercolors have survived. Our next example, also from the finale, shows how well-schooled he was in the counterpoint of Johann Sebastian Bach. He studied all the 48 preludes and fugues of the well-tempered clavier and wrote quite a lot of contrapuntal string music in his string symphonies before he ever tried a full orchestra symphony. This contrapuntal ping pong in the middle of the finale is an excellent example of how this surfaced in a mature work of chamber music. Let's hear it. <laughs> I never thought about this before, Gary, but there is a similarity in the structure to that little fugato to the very beginning of the D major uh, Beethoven cello piano sonata, the first one from August 102. Absolutely. And, and we have to mention that it was Mendelssohn who rediscovered Johann Sebastian Bach, who was okay. very unpopular in Leipzig. And now there's, it's, it's all about Bach and his statue in St. Thomas Church. Is Everyone associates uh, Leipzig with Bach. But if, if it wasn't for Mendelssohn, I'm pretty sure the statues would be elsewhere. It, it, you know, this, the thing is, this last movement, again, is very similar to the octet. Um, and okay. the chorale writing is incredibly similar. Um, and I think when we talk about this fugal subject, this counterpoint, it's incredible because in many places, the very beginning of this fugue, where the entrance would be expected, he doesn't give it to you exactly like Bach. But while Mendelssohn and Schumann studied Bach, in some ways, I think the counterpoint of Mendelssohn is more adventurous, is more imaginative, is in some ways more of an homage to Bach than um, the other great composers of the 19th century. He had a more thorough schooling in that. Schumann came to Bach relatively late, whereas Mendelssohn was put through his paces studying traditional counterpoint going back to Palestrina as well as Bach. And it, it surfaces everywhere in almost all of his music, but I love the parallel with the octet here. And we hear it again as we draw to the close of this movement because he's got five instruments playing and they sound like they're a full chamber orchestra. You know why it sounds like a chamber orchestra? Because he had a chamber orchestra in his house. Yes. <laughs> you have to remind everybody, he was born into a very wealthy family and he had incredible gifts such as a chamber orchestra, but you know what? He put them to good use. He actually made great music with it. <laughs> You can hear how he's reintroducing all of the themes that we heard at the very beginning, along with snippets of that little fugato. And they're all interwoven and there's doubling going on. A lot of the uh, strings are playing in double stops so that the texture becomes very rich and expansive. Laurie, such a pleasure to introduce our audience to this program. I'm so excited about our final concert on YouTube premiere, although I anticipate fully that when we come back, we'll still have many, many concerts that will be kind of duplicated on YouTube premiere while they're live with a live audience. But it's an incredible pleasure for, for me to always work with you on this. Your insight on the music is invaluable. And I thank you for 
coming through it during your vacation. I just want to tell everyone in the wonderful Fort Worth audience that I can't wait to see you all again at the Modern in September. And we will see you very soon. Enjoy your vacation and enjoy the concert, everyone.